Um, I will go for that. I've written a book. Please buy my book. Because last week I quit my job and I really need to live. Because my mum is now so proud that two of her daughters are going to be effectively unemployed. Uh, we're sharing this dress. So, um, I have written a book. It's called Herding Hemingway's Cats. Available for sale from on good bookshops and including Amazon. Uh, tolerate my whimsy. <laughs> the book's called Herding Hemingway's Cats. Uh, basically, as a writer, I absolutely love Ernest Hemingway. I love kind of punchy writers. The man could deliver a punch. And also, yeah, the sort of misogyny, homophobia. Or, no one's perfect, all right? But also, as a biologist, I love Ernest Hemingway. Uh, for the following reasons. Well, okay, so there's there's three things that Ernest Hemingway liked the, that I like, and they are um, things liked by Ernest Hemingway. Fighting, as exemplified in his books, you know, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Death in the Afternoon, I mean, m most of them, war, he liked war. Fishing, guy loved to fish. Uh, old Man of the Sea, the man loved fishing. Um, mating. And all of these three characteristics, they come together in one organism, which is... Cats. 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 And specifically with regard to Hemingway, these cats. So these are the Hemingway cats. Now, Ernest Hemingway, his estate in Florida is basically overrun with six-toed cats. You can see here, this cat's got like kind of a, a normal paw, and then it's got like these three weird thumbs. So these are polydactyl cats. They often have more than six toes. They have sort of extra thumbs, extra digits. And um, all up the eastern seaboard of the US, you can find these cats. And the story goes that Ernest Hemingway was given a six-toed cat by an old sea captain. And there are very, very good reasons why six-toed cats would be popular on ships in the time of seafaring. And uh, I'll outline them for you now. So this trait is called polydactyly, many fingers, many digits. So uh, there was the idea that polydactyl cats, they were perhaps better at mousing. Lots of mice on ships, and they have big paws, you know, they can like, get the... <laughs> <laughs> and then they leave it half dead in the captain's bed and all that kind of stuff. God, they're bastards. Um, Perhaps there was also this idea that uh, they have this slightly prehensile thumb. Um, uh, if you have an extra thumb as a cat, you have sort of some aspect of prehensility. When the ship is tipping in the stormy weather, and you can grab onto a rope. And like, uh, so there was that idea that um, that this would prevent them being, you know, lost to the uh, the briny deep and the gene pool at the same time. So the, uh, there was that that was a selective advantage. But I think probably the most important evolutionary reason that these six-toed cats persisted on ships and, uh, and then since have persisted up the eastern seaboard of the US and in Hemingway's house is that sailors are really, really fucking superstitious. And obviously what's more lucky than a cat with five toes <laughs> is a cat with six toes. So very, very strong evolutionary pressure to keep this trait I'm going to do a bit of, bit of molecular biology, bit of genetics, and talk about the genes responsible for this trait. So the, the actual gene we're talking about is a gene here, SHH. This is a gene called Sonic Hedgehog, which is indeed named after the cartoon character. There's a lovely story. The lab that discovered it, um, the, the sort of senior professor, they discovered that uh, one of the postdocs named it Sonic Hedgehog after his child's cartoon book. And he was really amazed to see that their new gene was so popular that McDonald's were doing Happy Meals <laughs> based on it, which I think is lovely. Sonic Hedgehog is used all over the body in development. It's a gene that helps cells make decisions. So it's used in the brain. Uh, CNS here, these are genetic switches that turn it on in the brain. They act on the gene, turn it on in the brain. They help brain cells decide, are you going to be a, like a nerve cell or a supporting cell? It's turned on the epithelial linings. These are the genetic switches that turn it on there. Uh, you know, you're going to be inside, outside, guts or blood, or whatever it is. Um, my development gets a bit sketchy there. But the thing I'm really interested in is this thing here. It says limb bud, and it turns on Sonic Hedgehog in a stripe, in sort of the fleshy bit at the bottom of a developing paw, 
So you can see that's a mouse paw developing in the womb. And the blue thing is where Sonic Hedgehog is turned on. And it doesn't say, you know, oh, you know, it's not a gene for toes or fingers or a thumb. It's a gene that says we're going to do some stuff here and keep going till I tell you to stop. And the ones down this end are going to be like little fingers, the ones down this end are going to be thumbs. And in the Hemingway cats, and also in polydactyl humans, humans with multiple fingers, as there's one type of mutation that causes it, there's a problem with that genetic switch, with that control element. And basically, it turns on Sonic Hedgehog just wrong. And so, you know, they, the fingers don't know when to stop making fingers. And they don't really know what to be. So you get extra thumbs. <laughs> now, I'm kind of wondering, we already know that there's been a significant evolutionary advantage to having this mutation. You know, it's kept sailors keeping these cats on the ships. Yeah, they're lucky. They're, yeah, they're, they're, you know, these are good, happy cats. And it did make me wonder, you know, where is this going to end up? Can they pick locks? <laughs> Load weapons? <laughs> and maybe kill us as we sleep? And I, for one, welcome our new feline overlords. <laughs> but these switches are basically evolution's playground, and wow, I'm really going to run out of time. So I'll kind of skirt through this. So, for example, there are sticklebacks that live in the sea, these ones, and sticklebacks that live in fresh water, and the ones that live in the sea have like these big spikes on their pelvises to protect them from predators. And the ones that live up in the lakes, they are really closely related to the sticklebacks that live in the sea. They go up to the lakes to spawn, they come back down to the sea. Some sticklebacks got stuck in the lakes and they don't have these spikes because there's no predators in the lakes. And when you x-ray these sticklebacks, their entire pelvis is missing of the sticklebacks that live up in the lakes. Like, and we have this idea that evolution progresses very slowly, you know, things get a little bit bigger, or they get a little bit smaller, giraffes get a tiny bit taller, there's tiny, tiny creeping changes. No, we'll just, just get rid of the pelvis. We'll just do that. You know, none of these, like, fembot spikes, none of that, all gone, just gone, gone. And the change that has happened, it's one tiny genetic switch that controls the gene. It's called PITX1, but basically it's switched on, uh, and it builds, helps to build a pelvis. And in the sticklebacks that live in the sea that have the big like, spikes, <coughs> it gets turned on and they make a pelvis. The sticklebacks that live in the lakes, they've still got it, they've still got the gene, but it's just not turned on, it doesn't build their pelvis at all. So really small changes, this is a couple of hundred letters of DNA that's different <coughs> uh, between these two types of fish that are separated by about 10,000 years of evolution, which is kind of nothing in evolutionary terms. Huge change. I mean, it's like waking up one day and finding your bum's gone or something. This is a big, <laughs> big change. Um, so we go very, very quickly. I'm going to... I've got 30 seconds to talk about cock. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies. Ladies. I don't know if you've ever had sex with a chimp. <laughs> but if you were to do so you would notice something. <laughs> and you'd also notice this. Um, so, many, uh, many species of mammals, uh, the ones that prefer a kind of, sort of more wham-bam, thank you ma'am approach to loving, such as we have uh, tomcats, mice, and chimps here, uh, their genitals, male genitals, are covered with these kind of, for want of a better word, spikes. <laughs> And the idea was that rather than kind of buying their lady dinner or treating her nicely or even maybe cleaning the toilet and doing the washing up, you bastard. Um, inside voice, inside voice. Uh, they would just, you know, just do it with whatever they fancied and the spikes would help them to cling on while she was running away going, you could at least buy me flowers. Um, so more promiscuous species, they tend to have spikes on their penises. This is how it works. Um, this incredibly pornographic picture here is a male penis, which I've been led to believe is not covered with spikes. <laughs> I had to do this talk in front of my parents. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. Dad never, I've never seen one dad like absolutely <laughs> <swear."> <laughs> And so uh, this is work by uh, David Kingsley, who also did the stickleback stuff. So he was looking 
at the DNA around a gene for the androgen receptor. This basically is a receptor for a, that receives testosterone and it does stuff. It makes men manly, you know, grows beards and willies and makes them put up shelves or whatever <laughs> the stereotype you can think of. And animals that have spiky boners, chimps, macaques, mice, they have this switch, it turns it on in their developing genitals. Humans, completely gone. You can actually hook this switch up to the gene and put it in male foreskin cells, because it turns out you can buy anything on the internet. <laughs> uh, and they will start kind of growing into like little spikes. Aww. So guys, you have it within you. <laughs> you have it, you have the machinery within you to grow a spiky penis, but you don't. <laughs> because you lack this genetic switch. And you know, we, we've already been warned about the risks of just those stories that you can tell about genetics, but maybe the idea is that, you know, there was one proto-hominid that was born a little boy, a beautiful boy, and he had a smooth penis. And when that little boy maybe started dating, uh, you know, he sort of go, goes with a lady, and instead of the, oh my God, what the hell is that? Jesus, spiky God, no! I'm never doing that again. Uh, it's just like, oh, that was, that was nice. Uh, do, do you want to come around again tomorrow? I mean, we could go bowling. Um, <laughs> should, do you want to do that again? Uh, Netflix? Um, <laughs> but anyway, so there's a just so story that perhaps this encouraged a more monogamous kind of human lifestyle and all that kind of thing. But all I can think about every time I see a penis is basically like, am I right, ladies? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Please buy my book.